Welcome to the yet another Less Matters podcast. Uh, this is one of the interviews we're doing with one of the many Less Trainers. I'm trying to get through all of the certified Less Trainers uh, in a year. It's going to be a hard push, but we're making good progress. And today is one I've been looking forward to for oh, quite a while, really. We have Robert Breezer, uh, a dear friend of mine, a uh, Less Trainer that I've known for, um, oh, I don't know now. Four years, maybe even longer. I think we met at the Amsterdam conference, the first no first one. What was it six years ago? So six years, yeah. six years, and uh, yeah, and we're only looking younger. <laughs> um, a fantastic guy, uh, well known for his work uh, on uh, remote sprint review bazaars. In fact, did a talk for the Less Matters community um, way back at the beginning of Less Matters community, which is brilliant. Uh, so yeah, Robert, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, would you like to give the world an introduction to yourself? Yeah, thanks, Ben. So nice to be here and uh, to to have the chance to talk with you. I always enjoy our talks uh, whenever we meet. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm Robert Breezer. I'm um, um, certified less trainer since uh, two years now. Um, yeah, I'm. Um, simple guy that uh, started uh, like born in Romania and lived most of my life in uh, Germany. I've um, studied computer science and uh, economics um, and, um, and, and worked quite a while as a consultant um, in the era of uh, software development, uh, especially uh, ERP software, SAP, and uh, to some point moved to uh, project management, but uh, it didn't feel like you know natural to me uh, until I until I moved. I, I, I uh, discovered um, agile, and suddenly things changed, and I was so obsessed about um, how you know there is a better way of working, and try to figure out everything about that and. Um, um yeah and uh very quickly i i i had a chance to discover less um and uh, or actually before that i've i've discovered scrum and and lived scrum really um uh, in a in a great example so um and i tried since then to replicate it and it was very hard to do that with multiple teams um until i um discovered less um and um that's the path that i was following now the last uh, seven or eight years i think since uh, 2015 uh was my first um uh, less adoption 2015 wow that was uh so shortly before we first met then was your first less adoption uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, around that around that time. So that's why I uh, I went to bus uh, uh, course um, because I wanted to to learn more about it. Uh, and then I figured out from from the course that there is this conference, and I went to it. And then there there we met. I remember we um, yeah we were on the first on the on the team. Uh, uh, it's actually a team based conference and. Uh, um, yeah, um, and we had a chance to to join one team there, and um, yeah, I was very impressed um, about your knowledge and about yeah also your your interaction, and yeah, um, had my role model. <laughs> oh no, they're too kind. I, I <laughs> too kind, mate. I'm a. I must remember that first less conference. I really felt like I was uh, as we would say in uh, in the UK, blagging it. I really didn't feel like I was. I should be there. I had um, I was giving my talk on a on my case study. Yeah, I didn't have a cable for my laptop. So I had to borrow someone else's laptop. I was on at the same time as a uh, Koiko Hadzik. So I'm like, well, no one's gonna come to watch my talk. Why would I, I guess want to come and see me? I, I guess that's why I didn't. I I missed your uh, your talk there. Sorry for that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you weren't the only one. You weren't the only one that missed it. And I, I remember talking to Goiko and I said, I said, I'm like, I'm, I'm upset. I'm going to miss your talk. Uh, I'm also a bit upset that you're talking at the same time as me because no one's going to want to come and listen to me. And he was such a sweet, he was such a sweetheart. He said to me that he was also upset because he doesn't get to see my talk because 
Goiko actually came and trained us in specification by example in the in the timeline of that case study. So he he had a part in that story. So it would have been lovely if he was there. But I, I remember the talk started, and uh, and the room was quite full. And then the room began to continue to fill up. And then when the room was at capacity, at the back I noticed Craig Larman like sitting there with like a I think he had like a notepad or something. Like, oh my word. <laughs> like I'm gonna like I know that Craig's been through my case study, but now I feel properly nervous. Like, like the boss, the boss is here, and he's gonna be marking me. And he was in. He asked me a few questions. Was incredibly courteous. He he was brilliant. Yeah. Um, and that was yeah, that was a that was a big moment for me. I was incredibly nervous. I hadn't slept much the night before either. So uh, yeah, thankfully I managed to pull it out of the bag. But you didn't miss much. I <laughs> I might give I might uh, start giving that talk again. Is it's that uh, was that recorded? Is there a recording of that? Do you know? Oh, do you know what? I don't think it was. I don't think it was. I need to. I'll find out. But it was a uh, because it was my case study at Royal Bank of Scotland. I haven't done that talk for such a long time. So maybe, but, yeah. I, but I do wonder. It's a good. I, I do wonder with case studies. Yeah. Sorry. Good. Sorry. It's a good opportunity maybe to do it again, either on the next less conference, which uh, maybe some of the people know uh, it's going to happen in Warsaw. Actually, we just moved it from Berlin to Warsaw, um, maybe there or some other place. I would love to to hear it. Not a bad idea. Maybe I would do a uh, a was it a a miscally of uh, less adoptions, a collection. Yeah, like tour through my life of less adoptions. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably be more like a horror movie than a fairy tale. But that's uh, <laughs> no, no. I, I will consider that. I will consider that. Yeah, but not now, because now, now, Robert, I want to ask you some questions. Yeah. I want to delve into your mind a little bit, and these are set questions. I'm asking every less trainer. You can answer these however you want. Speak from the heart, because I know you will. Now. The first question is a question that I've been asked on a number of my courses over the last year or so, and I find it a very interesting to, uh, interesting question to ask less trainers because people take very different angles on this. Yeah. Uh, whether it's like Boz Vodder's, uh, I'm not going to try and sell less, to uh, Ahmad Fahmi's, I'm not going to try and sell less. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping at some point someone's going to give me like a killer elevator pitch for less. Right. So, Robert, what is your elevator pitch? for less well um i mean simply said uh less is multiple team scrum versus multiple scrum teams saying you replicate the essence of scrum even if you do work with multiple teams and that's a very very difficult thing to do um, and to understand how to do that, you need to understand a lot of principle of organization. Um, um, things like uh, queuing theory, lean thinking, um, uh, and obviously the, the core behind Scrum, empirical process control, um, and to see how you can replicate that, adapt this in a big organization so less is a framework for organizational design uh, that allows you to simplify your organization and to work um and and to to be as an organization adaptable and customer centric like um a uh, scrum team is basically you can work on the most important thing for the customer side um, and it doesn't cost you anything, almost anything, to change direction quickly to start working on something else uh, if the customer needs something else. This is basically the essence of, of less, how to change your organization to be nimble and adaptable and, um, um, and, and um, you know, uh, create the most value uh, on the lowest cost. If I pick out some keywords, ones that... Right, hit me and hit me in the hit me in the gut. We're uh, adaptable, customer centric, and not simple, but it simplifies an organization yeah. and reduces the cost of change in direction. Yeah. Would you? You and you mentioned at the top of your pitch about the essence of Scrum. Would you say that those things are the essence of Scrum? Well, I would say that the essence of Scrum is first uh, like empirical process control. 
Um, so it's it's a framework that lives empirical process control, meaning you inspect, adapt, and create transparency on what's going on. And uh, because we know that in uh, in in complex environment, uh, so not complicated complex where you don't know what's going to happen next and what the customer needs the next step and so on and how they react to the things that you do you always have to change direction. You cannot replicate something that worked in one environment and copy it. Um, you, so this is critical. Um, and Scrum has a great uh, approach to, to live uh, this empirical process control. And on top of that, I think it's this, um, it's, it's, it's this customer centricity. It's the idea that, uh, first of all, you, you, you work directly with customers and there is no, um, um, uh, there is no one who manages the team's uh, work and monitors the teamwork. This is all the responsibility of the people that are doing the work, that are creating the product. Uh, so those are, for me, the core essences of, uh, of Scrum, this uh, self um managing teams the um closeness to customers and um, the whole empirical process control brilliant self-managing teams the closest to the, the the proximity to the customer and empirical process control because you can't copy and paste what worked one place and hope it's going to work in another i like it I like it. There was some interesting research um, by two people called Price and Toy that said that teams that have a close proximity to their customers are something like 30% more likely um, to reach levels of high, uh, high effectiveness in creating value. And that was based I, on a study of about 1,300 teams. Makes, makes a lot of sense. And I, I could guess that um, this might be also related to the fact that they might have more fun and purpose in what they are doing, right? So uh, the more you understand how you can create value to someone, the more um, purpose you see in your work and the more fun you have, I would say. And, um, and that's what I um, enjoy most about Scrum and less when done when done properly is that you see, um, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of this kind of like high, how to create high performing teams and, uh, you know, uh, hiring agile coaches that uh, are specialized in, yeah, I'm an agile coach who is specialized in creating high performing teams as if it would be a machinery and you have to you know deal some some things and make it high performing um but i i think like if you approach it that way that uh you you uh look or how to motivate people better um, um and especially like uh, touch this intrinsic motivations um you know and we know from daniel pink um the, the the three aspects to uh, intrinsic motivation that drives people um, auton autonomy, mastery, um, and purpose. So, if you if you help people to see those uh, things and uh, to live it, then they will automatically, from my perspective, become high performing um, because they have more purpose. They like what they do. They learn things, mastery. Um, and uh, they have the autonomy to decide things themselves. Um, and I think this is what I really love about uh, Scrum and less when done probably is that you all uh, you, you um, address all these three key aspects. Mm -hmm. I think the, 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 there's a Cancer Research UK and their purpose as an organization is to find a cure for cancer. That transcends how much money they're raising through charitable events or anything else that they want to find a cure for cancer. Yeah. People in the organization who are going to perform and who are going to make the best decisions are going to be people that want to help cure cancer. And this purpose, the thing that transcends the profit, 
I think is so important. I mean, in charities, especially in charities and public, you know, public sector type organizations, nonprofits, large non-government organizations, they have to be driven by purpose. But I think there's a huge amount that private organizations can learn from that. Yeah. Now, Absolutely. And just, that's, that's, that's the big difference that I see, like when doing Scrum uh, properly, when doing um, less properly, you, 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 you make clear, like, you know, what's the purpose of um, why we are, what, what do we want to achieve with this product? You know, and we have this broader product definition in less um, that is connected to, to somehow with, with the vision and with the purpose. Um, and unfortunately, most organization, large organization that I've uh, worked with or that I've seen, um, there are so many so-called scrum teams, right? So teams that are you doing this kind of uh, uh, scrum uh, practices um, and they, you know, do dailies, they do planning and review and all the stuff. And then they have a scrum master, they have a product owner for their team. Um, but basically they like, you know, they work mostly on components uh, or, or just very small part of the product. And they create the f fake uh, purposes for their kind of component or, or, or sub product, uh, which has nothing to do with that actual, you know, that actual purpose, that actual thing that you do for, for the environment, for the customers. Uh, and that's why it's so hard to motivate people, uh, you know, just to make this component more efficient and better uh, compared to um, create a cure for cancer, right? So it's uh, two different things. And um, um, that's what I love so much about LESS is that it creates really not only the close proximity to the customer like in Scrum, but also the bigger picture and um, giving every person in a feature team the opportunity to work on any kind of feature they would like to um, and create basically the next step to deliver uh, the product that will ultimately uh, fulfill this vision yeah, or the purpose. I think yeah, that's an interesting uh, goal, goal. I'm not sure if I mean to say goal, but one interesting thing about less is that it takes this scaling slash descaling challenge, however you want to word it, and doesn't mm. say how do we make this big thing work more efficiently. What it says is how do we take this big thing and actually make it simpler? How do we take yeah. this big thing and have teams? be nimble and act like they're in a small company? How do we yeah. maintain that proximity to the customer? Yeah. And this is that descaling topic, I suppose, where we remove some of the waste and we get things focused in. Or oh, actually, let's get people talking and let's get some of that small organization feel going on. Uh, much like in that less explain the video. It does yeah. say it, but what, when, when we were small, it worked really well. Yeah. <laughs> what happens when we get bigger? You know, we lose sight of that. We add in too much and we add I think a natural human kind of reductionist approach to things, we break things down and we silo things off. And yeah. I think the, the creation of silos is a natural human tendency. Right. The question is, is what type of silo? I mean, even less we have silos, they're just different types right. of silos. Right. It's right. the case of saying, well, how do we think about what silos we want to make and how do we make sure the interfaces between them are useful and actually conducive to, to achieving what we want to achieve? And yeah. rather than just adding layers of project management and PMO and, and the rest of it, uh, now, Robert, you spoke, you know, you had a nice kind of insight there into uh, says why you really like Les. The next question was, did you choose Les or did Les choose you? Um, have you? Do you feel like you've answered that question or is there, is there more that, uh, that perhaps you would like to say? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of, uh, uh, of, of both. So um, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was... Um, I, I, I was always, since I've discovered Scrum and I had a chance really to, to do this properly. I was working like my first team uh, in 2011 was doing continuous delivery. And we were basically, um, you know, after a check-in, we, the code was live after 45 minutes. Um, from every single developer, basically in the team, 
Uh, and that was for me just mind blowing. Um, and um, I was lucky to, you know, to, to be part of the team that um, knew so much at that time about continuous delivery. I think the book just came out um, uh, in that time, maybe one or two years before. Um, and, uh, and I tried to replicate that basically, and I couldn't like with all the teams that I work later and, uh, um, um, and the bigger the organization, the more it was, uh, far from, from that experience. Uh, so I was looking at ways to do that and, uh, stumbled upon less.works and started first, you know, trying some approaches for, for, from there. Um, and then went to bus course and, uh, and since then I just try to use more and more and apply this knowledge, um, um, as, as much as possible. So I think it's a combination about like, I was, you know, trying to choose less, but I also stumbled upon some of the things, um, yeah, myself, I guess, and, um, and, um, apply that, uh, uh, intrinsically the way uh, we want to have it in, in a less organization. So do you believe that your, your experience with continuous delivery maybe set you up somewhat for, so when you found less, you were like, well, hold on, there's a lot of similarities here or there's some, yeah. there's some relationship and that, and the reason I ask is because very similar to my journey, you know, we got the book continuous delivery, blew our minds, followed that, we also you know, got hold of one of Boz and Craig's books, began to run some of those experiments, and we found that yeah. it all came together beautifully. And that's yeah. why I got it, found really interesting yeah. is you did CD and then found Less Dot Works, and then and your journey went from there. So yeah, it was a mixture of uh, doing the CD stuff, which you chose that, but then found Less Dot Works, and it and they, they did it did it give you a way to maybe see how you could kind of get some of that CD good stuff back with the in a bigger organization yeah absolutely i think that's that's um i've i've um i mean obviously uh you can you can do continuous delivery without doing scrum um and the other way around but if you put those things really nicely closely together uh you you know, create an um, uh, amazing uh, double effect, I would say, right? So when the world, we always say that, um, you know, the, the organizational um, um, ad, ad, ability to adapt is uh, um, dependent on your technical um, ability to adapt, right? Uh, and the other way around. So if you cannot deliver basically um, very fast a new product increment, then it doesn't matter how great your organization is and how you set it up and uh, uh, so on if um, you know if you cannot deliver uh, this. So you need basically both those components um, to be able to adapt uh, as an organization quickly and change direction at a low cost. Um, but it's amazing if you if you um, you know make progress at both sides. And to see this happening, so like the processes, the organizational uh, adaptations and change, as well as technical change. Yeah. So, with all that in mind, because you've mentioned a lot of things that you like about less, yeah. Uh, what is but what's the one thing above all others that you uh, that you love about less? Um, I think um, my uh, I, I think it's, it's the idea that, first of all, it has a clear optimization goal versus all the other uh, frameworks that I know. Um, this is so amazing that not only uh, we can say that less um, um, clear optimization goal is uh, for highest customer delivering highest customer value, um, uh, and like at minimal adaptation costs. Um, but also you can basically um, explain all this, the rules, the whole less framework with causal loop diagrams uh, and to, to, to explain basically every single rule there is 
um, and why it's uh, optimized for organizational adaptability and customer value. So this is one amazing thing that I really like uh, about LAS that it so uh, makes a lot of sense and you can explain the rules, um, why they are there, what are they trying to, to optimize. And that, that you have this principle um, behind that, that, that you act basically on, on principles that guide you um, and, and you know, basically have this kind of perfection vision that you try to, you will never be able to reach, but you can um, um, yeah, work against. And there are many principles that, that I, I love, but especially the more with less principle, I think is my favorite one. Um, because yeah, you can do so much uh, more with less uh, in, and you can see this principle uh, living in in everything that you do, basically. Right? So um, yeah, I'm that's yeah, um, I'm a big fan of this principle, and obviously about um, you know the whole simplicity behind. Um, Less, I mean, not that is a simple framework, as you said it, but it, it uh, simplifies organizational design and uh, makes up obviously, um, you know, the, the organization um, simpler to approach in, in, in some ways. So uh, with the optimization goal, there's a clear and compelling why. There's a, there's yeah. something which yeah. helps you understand yeah. and things like the principles, which is saying you love that and particularly more and more of less principle because you can get more with less. So the uh, yeah, clear yeah. and compelling why and some of those principles, I think they're good, good reasons to love less. Is it, I've always had a, it's interesting because it has been a shift away a little bit from bars and maybe Craig, I've got, I might have that wrong way around away from this idea of an optimization goal, but I think it, you know, it sticks with people and I, you know, and I think maybe, because we've been around for a while, we, we really carry it with us. Because I, I also like having that. It gives me a gives me a north star by which to judge some of the decisions when I'm trying to use less in an organization. And there's a, another great thing you said there around this, sim, this simplicity. In the frameworks on paper are really simple. Because less is yeah. this overloaded term, it isn't just less doesn't mean just less framework. It's right. less you less and less huge frameworks. It's the principles, it's the guides. Nissy experiments and it becomes yeah it's, it's a big old encyclopedia of experience and experiments and knowledge there which really helps people you know use it increasingly well and I think that's uh, yeah well definitely one of the reasons why why I love it. I, I I love it so much I love the the overloaded nature of the term even though yeah. maybe it's a little bit confusing at times. Um, so. Your first uh, foray into continuous delivery was um, about 2011, you said, and then you begin to found, yeah. you found less, less stop works in particular shortly after that. So you've done a number of different less adoptions in your less career. Think, thinking about those adoptions, is there anyone in particular that sticks out as perhaps being your favorite or your and maybe it isn't right to have a favorite, but the one that really sticks out in your memory is something which was uh, good for you and for um, others. Well, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, obviously, you know, it's it's hard to pick one. Um, obviously, the the first one was um, had a huge impact on me, and I that's the one that I. Uh, spend a lot of time digesting, obviously writing the case study that was uh, 2015 um, and um, at, at a big software company in Germany. Um, and uh, there um, we scaled from three to five teams and also had a chance at the beginning to create a new setup of those three teams. So um, I used all the knowledge I had at that time um, to, you know, to uh, to create a very less like setup, and to see basically uh, how less could work and how we could move over the time uh, to less. And uh, was my first experience with that, and uh, um, I really, really liked it. Uh, I also had a chance to work on one of uh, maybe the biggest less 
adoption in Europe um, at BMW um, together with other less trainers. Uh, Craig was there, um, Victor was there, uh, Greg, um, and obviously uh, Mark Regenser and uh, also um, um, Konstantin, who, who now is a trainer and still works for BMW. And um, it was a great experience to work together with uh, multiple trainers and, uh, um, and, and work on such a less huge adoption with hundreds of, of teams um, in a very, you know, uh, complex environment where not only software, but also hardware is produced or this software was integrated into cars. Um, and, um, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that was definitely another highlight of mine. Um, but to be honest, I mean, I think, you know, any kind of newer experience um, seems to top the ones uh, before. So uh, lately I was doing uh, uh, one team less uh, adoption, which is Scrum, uh, as we know, but, uh, you know, it's like using this knowledge and, and, and um, uh, utilize them and with all the new um, knowledge that, that I've learned in the past from, from the other less adoptions um, and uh, experimenting with many different techniques that I learned over the time, like you mentioned, uh, Koiko, um, not only specification by example, but impact mapping and using those things, um, it, um, yeah. It's it's a lot of fun doing. Uh, you know, you mentioned the sprint uh, remote um, uh, review bazaars. Those are amazing things to to experiment, and uh, it seems to get better and better. Like uh, every uh, new adoption and every uh, new product development endeavor that I join um, seems to get better and better uh, with the with the knowledge that I gain and uh, with the uh, fun experiments that I'm trying to introduce and make. So you're, uh, what you're saying there, Robert, is you're getting better with age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're maturing well. <laughs> I will, um, all those, tra those brilliant trainers you mentioned, I'll put their um, websites or LinkedIn details or Twitter, et cetera, into the notes for the show so people can look them up and for, learn a bit more about them. And also the BMW case study was released quite recently. And I say quite recently, yeah. uh, this being February of 2022. So I'll also pop a link to that into the show notes. If we can give that a read. So it's, uh, yeah, as you said, huge, huge less adoption. I mean, roughly how many teams were involved in that? Um, well, I think by the time I was there, they were like... Um around 18 or something, I guess. But um, as far as I know now, it involves over 100. That's a mind boggling number. We've, we've got uh, Constantine is coming on to the podcast in a few weeks, I think. Uh, so we'll get, I, I'll, I'll be drilling him for a bit of information on that too. Yeah. So brilliant. Cool. Thank you. So what was your favorite lesson option? Uh, effectively all of them. Yeah. It's like, you know, you can't have a favourite child, can you? So I, 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 I know where you're coming from. But you, you'd never <laughs> say that each child, each new child is a bit better than the last. I don't think that would go down very well with the kids. Um, right. So uh, last question about less. If you could change one thing about less, and I mean less than the, the overloaded nature of the term, what yeah. would that one thing be? Um, yeah, that's... Uh... You know, tough question to ask. I mean, um, um, I don't think I, I'm not sure if I would change anything about the the overall concepts and 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 frameworks and so on. Um, I think the only thing that I would wish for more is uh, like popularity, <laughs> so marketing of less and uh, just. Uh, having a bit more exposure, you know, um, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, this is also a, a quite a 
difficult topic because I know, um, and I think you mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you know, Bas and Craig, they really rather want to have real uh, good less adoptions than to have many, many uh, worse uh, adoption, like the first adoption principle, right? Um, uh, rather deep and narrow versus broad and shallow. And that's how we like it. And, and um, um, I'm a huge fan of that uh, also. Still, I think, you know, we, we, we know how famous the Spotify model became after the video and uh, a lot of companies just wanted to copy that. And um, don't know if, if it was a good idea or, or bad, or if, you know, it's obviously it has now also quite a bad reputation because people were just trying to copy it. But having this kind of like having, you know, maybe the one company that does less and say they are so successful just because they adopt less might, might um, give more visibility. And again, with visibility, that might be also a uh, move into very uh, fake less adoptions and a lot of, um, you know, uh, fake stuff. But I still would want people to learn more and know more about. There are still so many good agile coaches, um, um, even great agile coaches, uh, I guess, that haven't been maybe heard about less, but really haven't uh, explored it and, and know about it. And that's something that I really would like to change or um, have more visibility about what less brings, um, or at least, doesn't have to be less, but the less principles and uh, the um, the core behind it. You know, like really people dealing more with with the principles, with lean thinking, uh, applying that queuing theory. Um, even if they don't talk about less, but uh, to see people um, in their day to day lives uh, work more with this uh, less principles, that's something that I would love to see. Brilliant. I would love to hear more less stories coming out. I think that the the process to get case studies out there, as mentioned, I think Bars mentioned this, is a bottlenecky process, and, it, and it's designed to be bottlenecky. There isn't any at the moment, as of you know, the time of this recording, any real intention to change that process. I do think that less would be better known, and the opinion would change if if some of the less like stories came out if people were to share more about the fact they've pursued one principle and what's happened as a result of it and that they've been successful, yeah. even though they haven't used all of less, but they've used a part of less and it's actually yeah. paid off dividends yeah. for them. So if you are listening Absolutely. to this and you've got a less story, please do get in touch with me and uh, go to the website, lessmatters.co.uk. There'll be a way that you can find me on there. You'll find me on LinkedIn, but let us know if you've got a less story because we've got some great people coming up talking about their less stories, things where there aren't case studies written. And I think that people need to hear about actually less can be really useful and really successful, even if it doesn't end up becoming a fully rubber stamped, you know, uh, Craig reviewed uh, case study. Right. right. But thank you for that. Yeah. And I, I would like it to be more popular too. I think we'll get that. I think people will realize it's actually pretty awesome. In the end. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, you started a big important step with those videos and uh, um, yeah, that's a good, good uh, path to go. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, the videos are fun. At some point, I need to think of a new thing. I need to find a, like a, new, a new USP, but I'm happy churning them out for now. Um, those videos, um, there'll be details where you can find those in the show notes. So Robert, the last two questions, we are done with less questions, finished. Two, well, maybe. Then with less questions, maybe not less answers. Two last questions are about Agile. Now, first question. What is something in the Agile world that should have been more popular than it was or is? No, good question. I mean, um, I I have to say what, what pops in mind immediately. Obviously, we talk about continuous integration, and I feel like now this is something that is picking up a lot and it is like there is uh, might be just not many 
ex successful companies that didn't uh, know about that. It might even go in the wrong direction with DevOps and uh, making just uh, separate departments for the whole continuous integration and don't understand this as a mindset. Uh, as as we want them to, uh, as a as a change that every developer needs to understand, but I think that's very very crucial. I would want it to be more visible. Um, I I think uh, the whole uh, extreme programming practices should have been much more popular than just the Scrum framework. I wish uh, people will uh, uh, dig more deeply into extreme programming, learn more about those practices and apply them um, in addition to uh, Scrum. Um, and, and one thing that influenced me most or from, from all the things, um, and I've, you know, I've, I've, I'm a huge fan of Goiko, the things that he brought specification by example, and and impact mapping um, and all the stuff. Um, uh, and in addition to that, uh, one thing that I've learned about from uh, actually from from uh, a reference in uh, a, a um, book note in one of the last books was uh, skill facilitator, the concept of um, how to basically work with teams and create um, um, a mindset in the team that helps people to work together uh, versus against each other. Um, and that's something that I still think uh, is uh, not very um, visible or popular. Um, and I would love, I mean, uh, it's quite similar to a nonviolent communication, and this is quite well known. Um, but it has it's it's even um, more concrete, I would say, and uh, more practical. Has also some principles in the back, and I would encourage a lot of people just to look at uh, skill facilitated and learn from that. I've I've uh, had a chance to uh, go to a course with Roger Schwartz. Uh, for five days um, and it had a huge impact on me. Um, and um, yeah, I would also like for people to learn more about that. Brilliant, what a tip, what a brilliant tip. I think if, I I, I wish that would be, a, that could, I wish it had been more popular. And actually the next question was, uh, what do you think is gonna be the next big thing? You know, I, I would wish that, Facilitation, like group facilitation and a better understanding of team coaching became the next big things. Because if we can yeah. if we can help people talk to each other more conducively, have better conversations right. and build better relationships, everything else will begin to solve itself as long as we've all got an aligned purpose. And I think that those facilitation skills are absolutely critical. And yeah, just just ignored or not researched enough or dismissed. I think that you're right. I, yeah. I, I, I'm fully behind you on that one. I will put links to uh, yeah. the Roger Schwartz book and his courses, if he's still doing them. I'll put those in the notes. Um, and there's a few other little facilitation tidbits. I'll, I'll chuck those in the in the notes as well. And, now, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And and I think um, it's, it's yeah, I mean, and, and there's always two two parts of it. It's like the, the skills that you have to have when doing group facilitation when doing uh, team facilitation and uh, um and and making sure that everyone is involved and so on but also again it's it's the coaching part as you said yeah it's think about um uh, the mindsets that people are living and are are putting um you know putting with and um how they you know how they see this conversation as is it something that um uh, they have um discussion or dialogue you know so like is it um and and he likes to differentiate between two mindsets uh, roger schwarz does um like the unilateral control mindset where you basically it's like you playing chess or you do, um, um, you are either I write or you are wrong. Uh, you have some information and the other 
has uh, missing information. So that's why you know better than the other, which um, doesn't really help for having, you know, a, a great team and a, a, um, um, yeah, a good atmosphere. Um, and the other mindset uh, is the mutual learning mindset where you basically, there is your uh, experiences and your views and the other person's experience and views and you can both learn from that. You can uh, intersect them and basically see what, uh, what's the best next step, what you can do with both of these experiences and, uh, and learnings. And there is no uh, right or wrong per se. And there is no uh, game of chess it's more like you play puzzle. And to, to see and to change this, uh, this mindset in a team is mind blowing. So um, I've experienced this a couple of times, um, introduced it with all the teams that I'm working with and uh, to see basically then how um, this can, can change and suddenly they, um, you know, they they have more dialogue than a discussion in their um, um, meetings and events. Um, it's it's really cool, and I think, um, as you said, that might be the next big thing in terms of um, how to get people, um, yeah, more closer to each other and. Uh, and and change cultures in in organizations insightful yeah thought-provoking I, I i really hope it is the next big thing it reminds me boswell has said something which i don't think i've heard him say before or at least i didn't remember him saying before when i interviewed him recently um he said a scrum is a framework for creating great teams and I think you can't create a great team unless you've got some skilled facilitation yeah. and some understanding of team yeah. coaching. Uh, I think that absolutely, I, yeah. I, 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 I can't see unless it magically happens by default. You know, I don't see how skill facilitation and a bit of skillful team coaching isn't going to help to amplify the effects of a brilliant, of the brilliant framework that is Scrum and less. So, Robert, thank you very much for that. Yeah, I, I want to go and dig out my book and uh, look through the skill facilitator again. It's been it's been years since I looked at it, so you've given me a bit of a kick at the bum there to go and, go and read it again. So, Robert, thank you very much for going through these questions today. It's been brilliant to have you on the show. Now, I'm sure people are dying to know how they can find out more about you or get in touch with you, perhaps see some less courses that you've got coming up. Uh, so would you mind sharing with those that are listening or watching? where they can find out more information about yourself. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can obviously look me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect there and I'm sharing their um, um, updates and um, useful information. Um, you can also find us on leansherpas.com, uh, my company, um, where we post all our trainings. Um, and um and um yeah so obviously we also on linkedin uh, and try also some other media channels like instagram shortly so um yeah look out for for us there i'm happy to connect um and obviously would love to see the one or the other into um, my last trainings brilliant robert You've been a superstar. You've been a great guest. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I hopefully we can get you back on the show talking about something, a particular topic in more depth in the future. But for today, that's it. Robert, thank you very much for your time. Everyone that's listening or watching bits of this, thank you for your time. And we look forward to hearing from you uh, at some point in the future. And yeah, look forward to sharing some more insights and ideas from other less trainers and the wider less community over the coming months and years. So great. Stay safe, everybody, and see you all soon.